we are going to continue reading from the book of Deuteronomy 28, the same scriptures that you have been reading for now the third week. For now the third week. And we are also going to read 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 that we are going to read in unison. So I would want if you can to put it there when I finish reading at Deuteronomy 28. Blessings of, on obedience, Deuteronomy 28. If you are in Deuteronomy 28, it says, I am here, pastor. If you don't have a Bible, it says, I am begging for a Bible. Oh, if someone doesn't have a Bible, can the Bibles have to be here, yes. Just to give someone who needs a Bible. And remember to leave the Bible here. Deuteronomy 28. Because of time, I'll just give you two minutes to open Deuteronomy 28, and I'll read, and in unison, we are going to read 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. I'll go ahead and read. And it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord God, your God, will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offsprings of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your first. They shall come against you in one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I commanded you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Let's read um, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. And let's read that together in unison. So you can look here. You don't have to... Let's read this together in unison. But... This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let's read it again. Oh, we want to go back, then we, we will go to the next year. But I say, he who sows sparingly 
will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We don't even give of necessity. Not grudgingly or of necessity. He loves a cheerful giver. Today we are going to continue with blessings and curses, part three. And we are looking at the generosity key from the word generous, the generosity key, the generosity key. And before I get into to the word today, I just want to announce something that is wonderful. How many of us here knows, I know the majority of you guys, you are new, Sister Shola Papo. Can you raise your hand? Okay, quite a number of people know Sister Shola um, and other people who are worshiping with us in line to, uh, today. You're welcome. A number of you, I think you know Sister Shola. Uh, Sister Shola allowed me to announce uh, she waited last week. And it is just uh, wonderful. Uh, the wedding, we, she sent us the link and we watched the wedding. It was really, really wonderful. Sister Shola joined us some few years ago here. Uh, we went through uh, counseling. We went through deliverance with her. Uh, at one time, things were difficult when she moved to New York. She had to fly back. And we had to some time of deliverance and praying and the Lord has blessed and blessed her. But there's something that I want to mention about her that is linked to what I'm going to share today. She was in the cleaning of the church. And uh, she was making sure that the church is clean. Uh, and what she did uh, when she left, she says, uh, I see that we need things to clean the, the house, uh, including what are the things that we use to, to clean the, the house of the Lord, the mobs, the, the supplies. And she says, when I go to New York, I am going to be buying the supplies for the cleaning of the church. So she has been contributing an amount of money every month. Though she goes to her own church where she is, but she says every month, I will give this amount of money so that we have enough supplies for the church. Uh, she did not know that COVID was going to come, where we need more supplies, masks and sanitizers and everything, and she continued giving. She has left here probably a year or two, probably two years, and every time she sent a giving uh, to make sure that a job that she was doing here continues, and the Lord blessed her. She's a medical doctor. She's doing um, a residence. Her husband is also uh, doing residence, and uh, I can just see the hand of the Lord. The generosity key. Two weeks ago, we started a teaching on blessings and curses, and I'm learning quite a lot of things myself about blessings. We said the year 5781 or 2021 was tagged the year of breaking cases. And we said there's a window that just opens of breaking off cases. There is a case that goes to the third and the fourth generation. But this year, there's a window that just opens for those cases to, to break. In order to understand what cases are and how they operate, I thought we would want to know what blessings are, and how can we tap into blessings, what we call last week the keys of blessings. So two weeks ago, I believe that we learned some of these things. God wants his children to walk in his blessings. There are people in the Bible who were blessed. We can talk of Abraham, we can talk of Job, David, Joseph, both Josephs, 
are Mary, all those people, they walked in blessings. We said two weeks ago, blessings do not exempt us from trials and temptations and some seasons of difficulties in our life. But the end thereof is what? Blessings from the Lord. Blessings is increase, fruitfulness, abundance, multiplication. So what is a blessing? It is an anointing of God to release increase, prosperity, multiplication of everything that is good and everything that is pleasant to life. Just who doesn't want that anointing? It's a good anointing, right? Blessing connotes peace and happiness. Blessings include fullness, provision, perfect health, protection, success, peace, and happiness. The wholeness of it, the shalom. Solomon says, the blessings of God brings wealth and adds no sorrow to it. When the Lord blesses you, it brings wealth and no sorrow. And God himself says, I have thoughts about you, not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of prosperity and for you to reach an expected end. We also learned two weeks ago about partaking the blessings of Abraham through Christ Jesus. The last thing that we learned is about the doctrine of ascentism that crept in the church are the idea that being poor and miserable makes one holy. And in the Middle Ages, people had to take a vow of poverty because they think that if I am so poor, I am so holy. We agree that that doctrine is not biblical. God wants his children to walk in his blessings. Are we on the same page? I'm just revising two weeks ago. Then last week, we learn about the conditions of blessings, the if and then of blessings. As we read in Deuteronomy, if you do this, then these blessings will come upon you. I remember saying blessings are not accidental. They are not a product of luck. They are keys to blessings. So last week we learned some of the keys. Key number one, I would just call it K1. In order to receive God's abundant blessings, you need to obey his word and follow his commandments. K2, there are blessings that comes with honor. The Bible teaches us to honor God. He teaches us to honor thy father and thy mother. He teaches us to honor pastors. He teaches us to honor husbands. He teaches us to give honor where honor is due. So all this is from the word of God, and there are blessings that comes with honor. K3, worshiping God alone brings generational blessings that stretches to hundreds of generations. But when we mix worshiping of Yahweh and worshiping of idols, they, it brings a curse that goes to the third and fourth generations. Matthew 6, verse 12 says to us, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot worship Yahweh our God and Mormon at the same time. If God is God, then worship him. But as for me and my house, what are we going to do? We are going to worship the Lord. K4, meditate on God's word daily until your spirit, your soul, and your life agrees to God's word. Someone calls it delight in the law of the Lord. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, Do not let the book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, K5, trust and obey the word of God and be patient until the blessing flow your way. The key right there is be patient and don't faint before the blessing arrive. Be what? Patient and don't faint until the blessings arrive. Let me just add something here because I didn't say much about this last week. The patience aspect. 
you are praying uh, to get married. Ian Johnson said it. And Lord, please bring the right spouse for me. Lord, please bring the right spouse for me. But the right spouse for you is not in Johnson City. Right? And you are still going to be in Johnson City for two years and finish your master's and probably another year of OPT. But you are still praying for the right spouse. Do not faint in the waiting. Because now when you go to Minnesota, where you're getting your job, that's where the spouse is. If you find it in Johnson City, then you're not going to meet the right person. So there is a key of what? Patience. There's a time that I become a little bit frustrated when I was praying for marriage. I'm one person who's not shy to say I prayed for marriage and the Lord heard me and answered me. And when I was praying, when I was at university, undergrad, wanted to do it very early. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I was doing watch and pray. I was not praying alone. I was watching and praying. But I was not seeing anything. And it took, it took years. I was in college by then, somewhere in the 99, 2000. And I only married in end of 2006. How many years? Six years of watching and praying. You guys, I don't know why you're laughing at me. <laughs> so I was frustrated because the person that I was supposed to marry was not at my college, was not even in the country, was not even in the continent. <laughs> You get it, right? So if I fainted, I could have fainted without receiving my blessing. God had to open a door for me to swim over the Atlantic Ocean to come to America. That's where the person was. So while at least we are praying, do not faint. Wait for the blessing. Just look at your neighbor and just wink the eye. Today, as we continue to talk about the keys of blessings, I am going to talk about K6. Generosity is a key to blessings. Generosity is a key to blessings. That's number six. Our God is a generous God, and he is blessed. And when we become generous as his children, we also become blessed. God's word promises us that when we give, we shall receive. It's in the word of God, black and white. When we sow, we shall reap. When we give, we receive more than what we have given. When we sow, we reap more than what we have sown. Is it clear here? So I grew up a farmer, and I think you know that Jesus and God is a farmer because most of the uh, examples that are in the Bible <laughs> and most of the, 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 the proverbs and most of the, they talk about farming. So I think he likes farming a lot. When we have one seed of corn, in my country we call it maize, we have one seed and we dig the ground and we put it in the ground and we cover it and we water it and the seed grows and it becomes a maize plant or a corn plant, and it ends up having a cob. Some of them would have even two cobs. Each cob may have thousands of seeds in it. But what did we put in the ground? One seed. This makes sense, right? One seed has now produced thousands of seeds or thousands of harvest. So I want this to be in your mind. You never receive what you give from the Lord. When God is giving you, he gives you thousands more of what you sow. It makes sense, right? Let me just wash you with just a number of scriptures about sowing. Proverbs 11, verse 25. A generous person will prosper. 
whoever will whoever refreshes others will be refreshed the bible does not say a generous person may prosper it says what will prosper you will prosper if you are generous if you refresh others you will be refreshed if you give others when they are in need or just free will blessings free will blessings will also come to you but they do not come on the same measure that you give they will come more Luke 6 verse 38 give and it shall be given to you a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap or into your bosom for by the measure you use it will be measured to you so when you give when god gives you back he gives you back by the same measure but now it will be a godly measure not a human measure does it make sense that's why it has to be a good measure it has to be pressed down it has to be shaken together and running over because god does not give us with the same measure that we give Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that they may be food in my house, the house of God. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room for you to store it. This is an instance in the Bible, if not the only instance where God says, test me. Because he knew that people would struggle with parting with whatever they have. So I want them to test me. The Bible says, test and see that the Lord is, is good. So if the Lord says, test me, guess what? Test him and see if you will not pour more than enough for you. Bring the whole tithe into the storeroom so that there is enough food in my house. If everybody gives their tithe in any church, there will not be lack in that church. If everybody in that particular church give their tithe, there will not be lack in that church. If there's one who doesn't have, the elders of the church will take from the church and give the one that doesn't have so that there is enough in the storeroom. Proverbs 3 verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Let me just talk about the first fruits here. The Jewish people call it Rosh Chodesh. And this, they do it in the beginning of every month. They give the first fruits. But application to you, you get a new job. When you get a new job, some people, they take everything that comes from the first salary and they gave it to the Lord. Some, they take a good portion of that comes from the first salary, and they give to the Lord. This is your first, and you give the best of your first unto the Lord. Some, they do that in the new year. As we start the month of January, they say the salary that I get in January is my first fruits. I am going to give it to the Lord. It was a requirement for Israel that whoever does not give the first fruits unto the Lord, a curse will be automatically pronounced unto them. The first fruits belongs to the, to the Lord. And I know how we struggle with that. Because when you come to the practical part of it is, in most cases we get our first job when we have been jobless for some time. In most cases, we have been even borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Then finally, we get a first job. 
And when we get a first job, our salary, let me just say, is 3,000. And when you have 3,000, then you think that I owe Benjamin $1,000, I owe Andironge $1,000, then I owe another person this amount of money. And the rest I'm going to pay my rent. So at the end of the day, we'll be like, I don't have anything to give to the Lord. So you'd rather give Benjamin his portion and Dironge his portion than giving your first fruits to the, to the Lord. Then if you look at the trajectory of your wealth, you see that in your job, you still struggle with money because you did not honor God with your first fruits. Proverbs 18, verse 6. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. It opens the way. It opens doors. How much should we give? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there is some decision making that needs to be done of how much you are going to be giving. I know there is quite a number of churches, and especially in my continent, and I don't blame the pastors for doing that. Because they would say, um, how much do you get from your job? I'm talking of, from my continent. And uh, the, you, 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 you say, oh, I, I pay per year, I get 100,000. But we are seeing that your tithe here is uh, not even a trillionth of what you get. So I know pastors back home who say, everybody br bring your pay slip. <laughs> yeah, bring your pay slip. And people were like, I mean, I'm, I, I didn't struggle with that because I was giving my tithe here and there. And I was not giving my tithe all the time. And uh, I'm not going to go into whether those pastors are okay or not. That's not what I'm talking about here. But you just have to decide in your heart what you need to give. But what God requires has to be given to God. I'm going somewhere. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So what God looks at is the willingness. If the willingness is there, the gift is what? Acceptable. If the willingness, if you say, you know what, I'm going to the house of the Lord today. Um, you know what, I have this $20 that I want to give. That's how I'm deciding to give. I'm willing to give this. If just the willingness is there, the gift is already accepted. God does not want people who give reluctantly. He does not want people who are compelled to give. He wants people who give what? Cheerfully. Who give willingly. You know, uh, one of the churches that I went home, uh, uh, they would say, we are starting with tithe. The baskets are moving for tithe. So people put the tithe and you'll be like, okay, it's over. Now we are moving with the first fruits. There may be few people who have first jobs. They give the first fruits. Then now we are going to give with the building fund. Then the pledge has to go again for the building fund. Then now we are going to give the projects of children. Then the pledge goes again and give the And the pledge goes seven, eight times. And you see people end up just looking at each other as the plate is moving. I'm not saying what those pastors do is right or wrong. I'm just telling you stories. If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. Who do we give to? He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. So number one, we give to God, you are correct. Bring everything in the storehouse so that there's enough food in my house. Whose house? 
God's house. So we give to God, number one. That's 100% true. But the one thing that I wanted to add, when we give to the poor, we lend to the Lord. Just think of the concept of lending to the Lord. So, Jesus at one time says, oh, throughout the days of your life, there will be poor people on earth. So there's no lack of poor people. So there's no lack of opportunities to, to give. But if you give to someone who is lacking and who is poor, you are lending to the Lord. If you lend to the Lord, the Lord is going to give you back. That's what it means, right? But it doesn't give you back what you gave to the poor. So we give to God, we give to the poor. Luke 6, verse 30. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. I like that one. Give to everyone who asks you. But if that person does not return the money, don't worry. Uh, some of you will be like, oh, no, 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 no. I will go after the debt and says, you need to give me my money by the end of the day or else. If you give someone who is lacking, then you visit that person and you say, can you give me my money back? And the person says, I don't have the money back. Leave that person alone. Tell the person that when you have it, whenever you have it, you can what? Return it. And just leave that person alone. And see what's going to happen in between the, this time and perhaps the time that the person brings back or the person may not even bring back. See how the Lord is going to bless you. I have seen people fighting in church. Ah, you know, you know, we, we borrow each other in church and says, please, can you give me some money? Then I'll give you by the end of the month. End of the month, you are not given. Second month, you are not given. And uh, Sister, come, come to the back of the church. Let's talk. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, then we yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Sisters are fighting. <laughs> what are they fighting for? He doesn't want to give me my money back. I've seen this. I've been in church for a little bit. To, to have opportunities to see that. There's no need for that. God is the one who gives you back. But I am not also saying to you, when you borrow money, don't return it. I'm not saying that. You have to what? To return what you have borrowed. Proverbs 1 verse 25. Whoever brings gifts will be enriched. And one who waters who himself be watered. Proverbs 11, verse 24. One, give, one who gives freely, yet grows all the rich. Another withholds what he should give and only suffer poverty. Let me teach you something. Financial blessings is up to you. It's not up to God. It's up to, to you. It's a principle of life that God has just given. The principle of sowing and reaping. There are some principles of life. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you give, you receive. No matter who you are, as long as you were created by God, those principles operate. Let me read what we read together today. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But I say... He who sows sparingly, it's up to you. You also reap what? Sparingly. But he who sows bountifully shall also reap what? Bountifully. So it's up to you. It's up to your own decision. If you want to receive bountifully, you sow bountifully. If you want to receive a little bit, you sow a little bit. The math here is very simple. If you have 5 kg of corn seed and you plant one acre of your field, you can harvest at least 500 kg of corn as a harvest. But if you have 500 kg of corn seed and you plant some few a hectare, you can receive 50,000 
kg of harvest. So what you sow just multiplies. If you sow little, you are going to get little. If you sow more, you are going to get more. The Bible says in Exodus 23 verse 15, do not come before God empty-handed. How many of you have gone to Walmart empty-handed? I'm not seeing any hand. Just think, you take your car, you know, you brush your teeth, and you drive to go to Walmart empty-handed. What, what are you going to come from Walmart with? Empty-handed. So when the Bible says, do not come before God empty-handed, that's what the Bible means. Do not come before God, what? Empty-handed. Pastor Paul said something that made me to start to think. I never thought about it. He says, during the course of the week, you have enough money for food, for jollof. You have enough money for gas. You have enough money for everything that you need. In other words, you are paying something to get whatever you get. But when you go before the Lord, you come empty-handed. That's the only place that you can come empty-handed. So if you go, let's assume that you go empty-handed, who do you blame? Yourself, right? So do not come before the Lord empty-handed. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. In Bread of Life, we teach about giving once a year. Some of you probably have been here and have never really given a teaching about giving. Do you know the reason why we don't do that? Because we have heard enough preaching about giving already. I know that you have heard enough. What is just left is what? Obedience. So I can't, you know, I, I, I've been to churches whereby in four weeks, four Sundays, one of them it has to be a preaching on what? Giving. Three is something else, one on giving. But here we preach giving once a year. There are times that we, can, we even forget to preach about that because we have heard enough preaching about this key, the generosity key. We have heard enough about that. Proverbs 11, verse 12, there is one who scatters, yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than what is right, and it leads to poverty. There's one who just gives. Oh, brother, so-and-so is in need. Oh, here is it. Oh, here in need. Here is it. Oh, you know, back home, they are in need. Here is it. They, they just scatter. They just scatter. Wherever there is need, they scatter. Yet, they end up with more money. But there's one who is thrift, a thrift store. <laughs> who be like, ah, hmm, I have um, $20 in my wallet and $5 and dollar, dollar, dollar. I'm going to give a dollar. The least amount, that's what I, I give. It's okay if that's what you decide to give. The Bible says poverty is a curse. Malachi 3, verse 9. Poverty is a what? Is a curse. Poverty is a curse. Can you put Malachi 3, verse 9? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So a whole nation can be under a, a curse. A whole nation can be under a curse. There's no better country that was been under a case than my own country where I come from originally. And I've shared with you that when we got independence in 1980, uh, between 1980 and 1985, I was very young, but I still remember listening to the radio when they say, and the Canadian government has given like 100 million, and the British government has given whatever million, and the Danish government has given... I mean, the money that was flowing in my country in the first five years of independence, if the president wanted, he would give million to every person in the, in the country. We were only 12 million by then. He would give a million to literally everybody. We could be millionaires the next morning. That's how much money was flowing in my country. Not only that, we have a lot of resources of gold. 
and diamond. I mean, a lot of that. Uh, we, 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 we received the best rains and the agricultural soil and everything. It was everything. And, and we were left. We were using the British pound when we were colonized. And when we were using the British pound, we, they, they were told to give independence to the, to the owners of the country. And the person who was leading the country, the white guy, Smith, refused. So he declared independence, what they call a unilateral declaration of independence, that we are now an independent state. We are independent of uh, the motherland, UK. We are our own country. You know what? At that point in time, the Zimbabwean pound was stronger than the British pound during that period. Are, are you listening very carefully? The Zimbabwean pound, we're using pound, which was a little bit different from the British. It was more stronger than the British pound. And if I take you 10 years down the line and 20 years down the line, we ended up printing money. We printed, I think, $2 trillion. Then we printed $50 trillion. To the extent that everybody in Zimbabwe was a trillionaire, but they did not even have enough money to buy food. How did we come from a position where we had more money in U.S. dollars to a point whereby everybody becomes a beggar? Teachers quit jobs. Nurses quit jobs. Civil servants, they quit jobs and go to sell tomatoes. Go to South Africa to buy things and to sell. I'm talking of people with degrees and everything else. How did we reach there? A whole nation was under a, a case. So a case can be individual, can be family, can be a whole nation. Think about your nation a little bit. Think it's, uh, it's blessed a little bit. Let me uh, proceed a little bit. I want to give you a case study of blessings, and I want you to listen very carefully. A case study of blessings. There was a man called Abraham. He was obedient to Yahweh, God. He was told to leave his kindred and in faith go to a land that he doesn't know about. And along the way, as he followed what the Lord said, as he was going to find that land that he did not know where it is, God tested him. God does not tempt. God what? Test. God tested him. He required him to sacrifice his own child, the child of promise, Isaac. And he had Isaac when he was 100 years old. And his wife was 90 years old. And he says, give me that son. God, but you said through Isaac, I am going to be blessed. I am going to have many other children, as much as the sand sea, as much as the stars in the heaven. How can I now sacrifice Isaac? But he did not reason in a Greek way or in a Western way. He reasoned in a Hebrew way. God is the one who gave me this child. If God says he wants him, I can give it to God. And in any other way, God can return it back to me. Though I do not understand everything, but I trust God. The Hebrews' philosophy is, we don't understand it, but we'll do it. The Western philosophy is, we have to understand it, ditto, ditto. And if we do not understand it, we don't do it. So he says, I'm going to give you the child. And he's thinking, all what God wants is, for me to cut my child for me to put my child and bend my child, and for God just to smell the smell of the fat that is coming from my child. And he says, I will do it. There are few people here who have children. Think of your beloved child that you love so much. And if God says, give me that one, will you? In total trust to God, Abraham obeyed and God accounted his obe obeying and faith 
is righteousness. So God blessed him. He blessed him right there. Number one, he provided the realm. And he says, no, 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 don't kill your child. I have seen that, Abraham, you are full of faith and you are full of obedience. That's the kind of my person, Abraham. Therefore, here is a ram. Now you can give me a ram. Now you can bend the bend offering of a ram. But Abraham, listen to me now. You are blessed. Who is saying this? God, you are blessed, Abraham. Your descendants will be blessed forever. Abraham, and I am going to take you to that promised land that I promised you that you are going to find that land. Your descendants will go to that land. Not only that. He says, all the citizens of the earth are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. Are you a citizen of the earth? You are going to be blessed through what? Abraham. Uh, some they say Abraham, some they say Abraham, whatever comes first. All the citizens of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. And whoever blesses you, Abraham, will automatically be blessed. Whoever curses you, Abraham, will automatically be cursed. Abraham was a sower. Abraham was a giver. There's a time that Abraham was coming from a battle and he met Melchizedek. And if you hear the description of Melchizedek, you know that this is what? Christ. And when he met him, he just saw him. He was a, a, a priest and a king of Salem, Jerusalem. And when he met him, he took a tithe, not only of the spoils from the battle, but a tithe of everything that he had. Are you following? And he gave to Melchizedek a tenth of it. That's well before Moses. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He blessed Abraham with the ultimate gift that can be given something who is on earth. And he says the blessings of Abraham that you are going to experience, your natural descendants, your physical descendants, the Jewish people, are going to have that blessing forever. But also, your spiritual descendants, the Gentiles who become Christians, who are engrafted into the covenant, they are also going to be blessed. So the Jewish people, my case study now, they experience more blessings than any other group. They also experience a lot of persecution. They experience much financial success and better family and life outcomes and harmony than most groups. Let me talk about that group a little bit. According to Stephen Silberger, in the book that he wrote, which is called The Jewish Phenomenon, he says that the Jewish people have a Hebrew mindset that stretches over 2,000 years when God met Abraham and blessed Abraham and Melchizedek met Abraham and blessed Abraham. There are three mindsets, and I'm not going to go into the detail of that. I'm going to teach about that sometime. There is a barbaric mindset and his operational principle is fear. An autocratic government is a barbaric government. It instills fear into people in order for people to obey. Uh, when you're still in an autocratic government, they, they can cut your fingers so that you will never steal again. You no longer have the resources to steal. There's also a Greek mindset. A Greek mindset is the secular Western education that we have of problems and solutions. We have to think everything and statistics and everything. It has to add up. And we have to understand, even when we read the Bible, we have to understand everything. If we don't understand it, we don't believe it. We have written books and books of theology to try to understand things. And anything that we don't understand, we don't believe it. 
The majority of them, they don't believe the Holy Spirit because they don't understand the Holy Spirit. But we have the Hebrew mindset. The Hebrew mindset, the, 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 the Greek mindset, the, the operating principle is knowledge is power. Right? The, the Hebrew mindset is we trust God. We don't understand him. But we just what? Trust him. Whatever he says, we do. But we don't understand it, but we, we just trust him. Sil Beggar argues that throughout history, the Jewish people have been called the people of the book. Jewish children start to study the Bible, the Torah, at age three. At age six, they start to diligently study the scriptures and understand and ask mom and dad, mom, I was reading this. What does this mean? Dad, I was reading this. What does this mean? By age 13, they are, ex they are expected to have memorized a large portion of scriptures and they can discuss those as scriptures with some degree of understanding and knowledge of who God is. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. They teach the children when their children are young. When children still listen to mom and dad. That's where they teach the word of God. So as the children grow up, they will not depart. Because we always remember what you were taught. Find millionaires. And hear millionaires talking. They say, my mother teach me this work ethic. My father teach me this work ethic. When I was young, my father, they always remember what you were taught when you were young. To the shame of Christians, Muslims, they teach their children the Quran to the point that a seven-year-old, you cannot convince him about anything else but Allah because they are taught the Quran when they are so young. That's why they are so seared, their mind is so seared to what they learn when they are young. Christians, we leave the computer and we leave the TV. Uh, Bob, SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, that's what we make our children to listen to. Uh, Big Bird. You know, all those. W what are the others? Help me. Sesame Street. Yeah, that, that, that's what we leave our children to be to be taught. And when our children are taught about, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants, I mean, what do you get from someone with SquarePants? I have visited few people and I arrived in their house and the children are just watching stuff that way junk. There's one of my son that I love so much. I almost wanted to punch him. And you are going to say, Pastor, can you punch? Yeah, Jesus whipped people in the, in the temple. <laughs> so, don't, so don't even go there. I saw her daughter was listening to a witch. So it's, it's, it's cartoons about what? A witch. So the daughter called me and say, Pastor, Pastor, come, come, come. Witch, witch. So I didn't understand what she was saying. She was, she was very... Two years or something like that. Which witch? Then I said, probably, you know, you know, there's a sandwich place which is called the witch witch. And I said, probably, you know what? It's something to do with sandwiches. And I saw the witch on the broom and flying and stuff like that. And this child is listening to this over and over and over and over. And I said, do you know what spirit is being released through this? Let me teach you a concept. The Bible says, and the devil is the prince of the air. Have you ever heard that? He is the prince of the power of the air. Airwaves is the what you bring your internet. Airwaves is what you bring your TV. Airwaves is what brings a lot of information. We are in the information technology. It is an airwaves period. So you are leaving the prince of the power of the air to teach your children. I taught my children, you're not going to read uh, these uh, books from UK, Harry Potter. 
I said, you know what? It doesn't make you more intelligent or more anything. You're not going to read what? Harry Potter. Because why should my children learn about casting incantations and spells and jinxes and stuff like that? Why are you not teaching my children to meditate on the word of God? So Christians, we do a lousy job. And we have a big mansion and a big house and a big degree. And when people come, we want to show off what we have. But your children are being taught by which witch? I want us, you guys, you are lucky because you are hearing this before you have children. So you are not going to mess it up. So when you have children, I mean, how many parents have found a tutor to come to teach the children math? Many parents. But how many parents have found a tutor who comes home to teach the children the word of God? Because we take the word of God for granted. But what is important is Western civilization and Western education. The Greek philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. That is, that's important. That's an educated person. But for the Jewish, by three, they start studying the Bible. By six, they have a chunk of understanding of the Bible. By 13, they can argue with you the word of God. Therefore, they become successful because the principles of life that they learn when they are young, they do not depart them from them when they grow up. Let me move on. The result of this devotion in seeking the Lord, in reading the word of God, is that they internalize God's principles of blessings early and become acceptable part of the Jewish life. So the Jewish children, they just trust God. They do not understand some things, but they don't care about the understanding part. They just know that our God is the God of our father. This is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. This is the God of our father. This is the God that we worship. And God says this. We do this because God says this. Even many secular Jews, they often teach their children the word of God. It's a way of growing up. And because of that, they receive the blessings. Jewish children are taught about a holy God, one God, monotheistic God, not gods and idols. Holiness, holy days, holy people, and holy places. So they know what is important is holiness unto the Lord. So Sil Beggar researched the American Jews and he arrived at a certain conclusion that I want just to break down in the next five minutes. He says they arrived in America two generations ago as they were driven out of Europe from Britain, from, uh, from Germany, where they were persecuted from Austria and places like that. When they arrived in America, they were poor immigrants with only one bag of cloth and nothing more. But within two generations of living here in America, they have achieved a level of success more than any other ethnic group. The American Jews, they are only 2% of the U.S. population, meaning that they are somewhere around 11 million, um, 7 million. Yet, 20% of professors in all leading U.S. universities, Ivy Leagues, aid them, they are Jewish. Though they are 2% of the population, but 20%, they are Jewish. 25% of the American Nobel Prize winners, they are Jewish. But they are only what? 2%. 33% of all the multimillionaires in America, they are Jewish. But they are only 2%. 40% of the partners of the leading firms in Washington, D.C., New York, and big cities, they are Jewish. 75% of high-income families are Jewish. In many nations, other nations of the world, where Jewish people tend, they, they tend to rise to positions of wealth and influence more than any other group of comparable population. The operating principle is faith and trust Yahweh, the God of Israel, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, 
and God of Jacob. If you trust God, if you believe in him, there are some things that you will not understand. If you can understand everything about God, he is no longer worth your worship. If you can understand everything about him, then you are just as, as good as him. God, where we end, is that's where our God, what? Stars. The day that we say, wow, we are the wisest people. Look at our civilization. We have gone to the moon. And we say, we are so smart. God says, that's foolishness. Because even the moon that you are going to is the one who created it. So where we end, that's where he, he begins. Before I go further, there's another ethnic group also that is very successful. And you, 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 you can't stand on the way. They are a force to reckon with. They are called Nigerians. Yeah, they are called what? Nigerians. The ethnic group that is more educated than any other ethnic group in America, it is Nigerians. Yeah. If you talk of doctors and lawyers and uh, uh, PhD holders and everything, they are Nigerians. <laughs> you can go to any Ivy League. You have found even Nigerians uh, being the, 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 the head of the law society at Harvard. They have gone as far as that. In the Biden administration, there's a Nigerian. They are blessed. I'm still trying to find out why are they blessed. There's no way that you can just be blessed or there is a formula to it. There is a key to it that why they are blessed. One thing that I've also learned, they are not stingy. They give. And especially in the house of the, the Lord, they give. And the other thing that I, I've said about them, they are like Jacob. Whenever they need a blessing, they can fight for it. <laughs> by hook, by crook, they, they end up being there. They get it. The principles of God are principles of God. If you sow, you will reap. So there's no way that they are blessed more than any other group, and we try to find out. They give. Many Christians do not believe everything that is in the Bible. Many Christians, including theologians, do not believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. They cherry pick few stories from the Bible and common verses. We do a very good lip service to believing the Bible. But most of our life is influenced by church, our church denomination tradition. Have you ever heard people who say, um, you can only marry from our church and nowhere else? It's not in the Bible. Right? So we are influenced by church what? traditions. You know, the founder of the church says you can only marry from this church and you can't marry from anywhere else. That's dangerous. You, the Bible says you have to marry a child of God. No unequal yoking. That person who is a child of God may be of another ethnicity, of another race, or of another country, or an, of another school, as long as they are a child of God. And as long as God speaks to you to say, this is the right person for you. So we do a lot of things out of denominations. Our denomination does this. Our denomination does this. I thank God my pastor was not like that. Because Pastor Dumisa is not from my denomination. I don't know. You are told things that are not biblical, and we follow that. We do not allow the word of God to change our lives, nor do we meditate on it to allow God to give us understanding. So blessing and prosperity is enshrined in the principle of sowing and reaping. If you want to reap tomorrow, you have to sow today. In finances, sowing is giving, and reaping is in any form. The promise of God is if you give, you receive. God is a generous God. 
He wants his people to be generous. There's something that I'm going to teach, I'm going to finish in the next few minutes. Giving is part of worship. Giving is part of what? Worship. We kind of miss it because uh, Brother James comes or Sister Irene and read the word of God in Psalms and say, we are starting to worship now. Then our instrumentalists, they come and they hold instruments and everybody says, now it's time for worship. And we sing and we dance and we have fun and we are worshiping our Yahweh. Then after that, there is going to be the word. This is what is happening right now. It's part of worship. And after that, we can say it's now time for testimonies. It's part of worship. And the devil was defeated by our testimonies. It's part of worship. Then when we come to giving, something run in people's mind to say it's no longer part of worship. That's the spirit of poverty. <laughs> that one is the spirit of what? Poverty. Everything is worship except what? <laughs> giving. That's the spirit of Poverty. In finances, sowing is giving. Let me just explain to you, giving is part of worship. In the Old Testament, they would bring animal sacrifices, grain sacrifices, peace offerings, sin offerings, free will offerings, love offerings, first fruits, and tithe. And they would bring that to the house of the Lord and kill animal and take the blood and, you know, worship. It was worship. And they would sacrifice to the Lord. In the New Testament, we are now required not to bring animals and grain. What we are now required is to bring our hearts and our soul to worship the Lord. And we worship by praise. We worship by our singing. We worship by our tithe. We worship by our offering. We worship by using those things before the Lord, by the first fruits. We worship by alms, giving to the poor. We worship. In the Old Testament, giving to the poor was mandatory. In the Old Testament, giving to the poor was what? Mandatory. When you harvest, you are required to leave the edges of your field unharvested. And any grain that falls on the ground while it's harvesting, you cannot pick it. Are you following? So when you are harvesting, and this is the edge of the field, this is the edge of the field, you can harvest the whole field, but the corners you don't harvest. That's where the poor are going to get the food from. Are you following? And when you are shelling the crops, and a cob falls on the ground, you don't touch it. It's for the poor. So the poor now, when you finish harvesting your field, they will come to the corners and they harvest what you have left. They also come to the field and they are looking for anything that falls on the ground. So the poor are provided. Who has provided them? You. Because you have provided them now, God will bless everything to do with you. It was before the combined harvester came. The combined harvester just harvests everything there's nothing that is going to remain for the poor. Let me finish up. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Just allow me to finish up. Then, th this is God's law. On the seventh year, you should leave your fields and your vineyards and your, 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 your orchards to grow on their own. And you are not going to harvest anything that grows on their own. That's where the sabbatical year comes from. So the seventh year, you just leave your fields to grow on their own. And that year, oh, the poor will feast. They will come to your fields and they take mangoes and they take gooseberries and they take everything and they have enough. And it is your field that has taken care of the poor. He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. That's why they cannot lack because they lend to the Lord. When we fail to give what God asks, God says we are actually robbing him. Malachi 3, 8 to 12. Refusing to give what God asks for releases the opposite of a blessing. When it comes to tithe, he says, test me and see what I can do for you. So in the New Testament, there is an episode in the New Testament where 
they talk to the apostles, and the apostle says, we need finances so that we can take care of the gospel. And uh, they say, we are going to buy, I mean, to, to, to sell. So they sell the land, they sell the properties, they sell the houses. That's what Ananias and Sapphira, they did. And they brought everything. They didn't bring a tithe. They brought what? Everything, the proceeds from buying, selling a house, and they bring it to the feet of the apostles and says, here is it. Use it for ministry. Do you know that the ministry of Jesus was financed? Who financed the ministry of Jesus? I want you to talk to me. Okay, can you speak loudly? The disciples, partly, but not quite. There are specific people who are named by name in the Bible. Who financed the ministry of Jesus? Who are they? Speak loudly. I can't hear. Ah, you guys need to, you see? At three years, you're not reading the Bible. You're watching Bob Squarepants. <laughs> <laughs> and Big Bird. Say it loudly. Some women, and they were mentioned in the Bible. Mary Magdalene. She worked and she made money. And that money was the one which was used. And Joanna. And there's another one, a third one. They were working and working and working. And everything that they worked on, they come and give it to the minister of Jesus. And the person who was taking care of that money was Judas. And Jesus knew <laughs> Jesus knew who Judas was, what Judas can do, and Jesus never says, let's do a accounting to find out what Judas... No, it's like, I know you. Do whatever you want. As long as we have enough food, we are fine. God is going to deal with that on his own time. So listen to me. You cannot now come to me and tell me that women are not important. You can't come with your cultural face and say, hey, you know, th this world is for men and women have just to sit down and listen to us. If the ministry of Jesus was financed by exclusively women. So, remove your cultural head and honor, give honor where honor is you. The majority of the people in the church are women. So what are causing the word of God to move forward are women. So women do not allow anyone to say you're not important because who financed the ministry of Jesus were women. But Jesus chose men to walk with him to do the ministry. But they needed to eat. They needed transport. They needed money. And that was financed. Let me finish up in five minutes just. Not even five minutes, two, three minutes. If you're a person who sweat over tithe and first fruits, no matter how many sermons you have heard about giving, know for sure you have a spirit of poverty. You don't need a prophet. You don't need anyone to tell you that you know, there's a spirit of poverty that is following you because you have heard enough teaching enough prophecies, enough about giving unto the house of the Lord. If you choose to break that spirit, you can break it any minute, any time. You just want to, you need to repent. Lord, I've been sinning. I haven't been giving you your tithe. I haven't been giving you any first fruits. So I've been robbing you. The problem of robbing God, he says, you will let the devourer spirit to do whatever it wants to do. If you give to the Lord, he restrains the what? The devourer spirit. And the devourer spirit, that's the last thing that I'm going to talk about, which is two, three minutes and we pray. We still have time. The devourer spirit is a spirit that does this. You have been working and working and working and working and working. And you have been putting all your money into the savings. And you have been putting your money into the stock exchange. And you have been putting your money in different places. You have a very healthy portfolio. And you say, anything that comes my way, I have my, my money. Then the Wall Street at one time 
crashed. And everything that he had put in the stock market, you know, you know, you know my mentor told me when the coronavirus hit, he says, I lost 90,000 in one day in the stock market. How much? 90,000 in what? One day. The stock market crashes. And when it crashes, you are crying. And your heart is hitting the whole night because you are not at peace. Then you have been gathering and gathering and gathering and gathering. Then an accident happens. And the accident that happens, it also happens that you happen to be on the fault. And you hit a Benz, which is a new Benz, which is 200,000. Right. So you see, you have been gathering and gathering and gathering, but everything that you can gather, you can just lose it just like... That's the devourer spirit. That's the devourer spirit. He can restrain the devour, devourer spirit. So make sure that you trust the Lord. But if you trust the Lord, he will do a lot of wonders. Statistics shows that about 75 to 85% of people who win lottery and they become millionaires just to give them five to ten years, they don't have any money. The majority of them, they are living under a bridge. The majority of them, they are homeless. How can someone who win 50 million five years ago, ten years ago, ends up without money? More money is not a solution to the case of poverty. More money is not what? A solution to the case of poverty. A lot of education and a good job is not a solution to the case of poverty. Coronavirus hit, husband and wife, they both left, lost a job with their good jobs. Just think people who were in the uh, aviation industry, how much they lost. Investments in the stock market is not a solution to poverty, but obedience to the word of God and his commands are the solution to poverty. So the key to wealth, to prosperity, to good health, to success, it is generosity. And the Bible is clean about being generous. Let's stand up and pray. I, I wanted Pastor Dumisa at some point in time to show how this building was looking like before we moved to come over here. It was a dungeon, just to put it that way. It was a filthy, dark, dead dungeon. If you can remember, bring that. And we, since we started the ministry, we have been worshiping in our home. First, we went to three hotels, and we went to this church, which is two doors away from us. And we were sharing that church with uh, another church. We were worshiping in the afternoon, they worship in the morning. It was working for us, and the ministry was growing. And what happened, they said they were leaving. And for us to use that church, they were paying plus uh, for utilities. So they were paying 5000 a month. We by far did not have that money. So we said, what are we going to do? Are we going to find another hotel again? We started a GoFundMe. We have been running this church for about 11, 12 years now. We have done fundraising only once. Only once. And when we did that fundraising, we did that fundraising to make this place. And I remember very well a lot of people who were like you, who were students then, and some of them, they are still here, Brother Isaac, if he's still here. They gave because we wanted at least 30000 for us to make the whole place, removing the tile, put new tiles, removing the lights, put new lights, everything. That side, this wall was not here. It was supposed to be put. I mean, the children's side, everything for them to, to be done. It was a lot of money. And we just did it as a gesture of faith. We just said, Lord, we, we trust you. We don't understand it, but we trust you. I remember my children, Manasha and Ruben, God bless you for that. They were putting the money in a pig bank. And the pig was becoming fatter and fatter and fatter. Once in a while, I would put 
$50 or $20. Or, you know, once in a while, whenever they have money, sometimes, you know, people give them gifts, like Christmas gift, and they would put their money there because they wanted that money to use that money when they go to college. So when time comes for building the church, we asked them. And the, I mean, they liked the piggies. They loved them because they knew that their resources are there. And we say, you guys, can you take something from your piggy bank and give to the building of the church? And uh, they said, we want to have a meeting. How old were they? Just think, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, they are having a meeting, a board meeting, to discuss the biggie. And they finish the meeting and they say, we want to give everything. We want to give what? Everything. I said, you have been raising this money for a long time. It was somewhere around 200,000. Just think when coins reach 200,000. I'm sorry, 200, $200. It was a lot of money for a six-year-old. And they gave everything. I remember our sisters that we were worshiping with who are gone now. People gave. People who are students just like you gave 500, 600. I'm like, where are they getting this money from? I hope someone is not breaking the bank to build the church. People gave. People gave. There's someone we have never been to Bread of Life until today. She wrote a check for 10,000. It's never been here. It's never been blessed directly with us. There are people whom we had to read the name, like, who's this person? We don't even know them. But on my own, I've looked at the life of people who gave. Some are professors, some are pharmacists, some, I mean, the Lord has blessed them. You're talking of how green cards have been expedited. The Lord has what? Given them. It was then we wanted our children to go to a private school, a Christian school. We didn't really have resources for that. Our budgeting and our planning, we didn't have that. And that private school was quite, quite expensive. And we just said, Lord, we trust you. I mean, just to confess things, me, I didn't want them to go there because I just said, we don't have that money. And my wife continued to say, nag me and say, they are going to go there. Let's just trust the Lord. Sometimes even our faith as pastors, they also falter. Thank God for a woman of faith. And he says, they will go. Look, we have given to the Lord. We have poured to the Lord. They have given to the Lord. When the year of application comes, the policy of the school changed. They said, oh, the, the people who are coming to this school are just the rich people. The children of pastors are not coming because the pastors don't afford this amount of money. So if you are a ordained pastor who's registered in the state of Tennessee, we cut the fees by half. Uh, yes, it, you have to, your children have to be there for a year. And you pay what? Full fees. Then after one year, the pastor's thing will apply. But as soon as our children ended the same week, they say, you guys, it's going to apply to you right now. I, to the glory of God. And the other person who made me to nag me was Pastor Paul and Pastor Helen. Because their child went to that school. And they were always reminding me, Pastor, have you applied? Pastor, your children have to go there. And I said, this Nigerian, they are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Paul is the one who was nagging me and nagging me. And my wife took the spirit of Pastor Paul <laughs> of nagging me. And they continue to nag me. And the Lord blessed even the children. I am saying this for you to understand that what I'm preaching today, after some of you is the middle of months, you're out of here. Uh, some of you is a year, you're out of here. Wherever you're going to go, what I'm talking about here, if you want the blessings of the Lord, that's a key to blessing. That's why the Bible says, Cornelius prayers and devotion and the giving of alms had reached the heaven. And God had to send Peter because his, his giving had become a memorial in heaven. Are you following? Your giving, if it's from the heart, from a cheerful heart, it can become a memorial in heaven. And God says, ah, Eric needs a GA for his doctorate. 
and he has applied five places and all of them have not answered. I am going to bless him because he is giving and he may not have given a lot of money, but he gave cheerfully. So do not think that when pastors are preaching giving, we are guilty. We are not guilty of anything. When we are preaching giving, we are preaching to you the key of life. We have a brother that I love so much. Uh, he has not come to bread of life. Uh, he said that to, to, to me at one time, I want to give uh, students, during the summer, they do not have a GA or a TS, and they do not have enough money. So he has given thousands of dollars. He says, I want you to help students who do not have money during the summer. So summer, as a pastor, you are so comfortable. I just know that, you know what, I'm just using an example. Oh, Benjamin does not have enough money for rent. You know, there's enough food in the storehouse. Benjamin, here is, it. here is also your money for food. You know, oh, there's a new student who's coming from Kumasi that, who doesn't have a GA. Oh, thank God, the money is here. Because there's something that makes a pastor to be miserable, to have five, six people who don't have, and you don't have anything to give them. Not because there's no, it is because people did not give into the storehouse. But you guys, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys, you give. In Bread of Life, people give. They are not even preached unto giving, but you give. Today, I'm going to speak a blessing upon you. I want you to, 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 to take whatever you want to give to the Lord today. Those who are graduating this year, you came on Friday for a program for you to seal your blessing. We met people on Friday who are graduating this year. And uh, we prayed for you and we anointed you and we prayed for your destiny and we prayed for your life. And the Lord says, give to the Lord something that comes from you, that you feel, give to the Lord. And the Lord is going to, to give you. I have a, a son who was about to be thrown out of this country. His visa and stuff was messed up. And I said to, to, to the son, you have been giving to the house of the Lord. There is no way that you are, not, you are going to go back to Ghana. You have been giving to the house of the Lord. Let's speak a blessing upon the giving that you have done already. It is that very same week that the Lord blessed him with a job that is doing his papers. I'm just saying all this is to build your faith. I want you to raise whatever you want to give to the Lord. It is a key of blessing. It is not only financial blessing that comes your way if you give finances. Yes, you get finances plus protection, plus health, plus peace, plus other things. I want you to pray over what you're going to give to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and I bless your holy name and I glorify your name. Father, I